Hey, BookTube. It's Peg. Welcome back to the History Shelf. Today, or this evening, I should say, we have a massive book haul. You've come to expect these from me and my channel. Um, I have to say in my defense, first of all. Yeah, I want to hear this. Yeah. Princeton University Press. Blame, blame them. I will no, blame them. No. I will blame them, and here's why. Uh -huh. Once a year. They have their annual, obviously, um, <laughs> uh, sale where everything is marked down 75%. Do they, do they force you to, to, to do They don't f force me directly. It's an indirect type of, listen, Princeton University Press is one of the great I'm not publishing university that. press. Martine's really fighting me on this one. Um, I, I really want to hear the rationale for why the, you, the, were, you were The rationale is that I had a little extra spending money, wanted to stimulate the economy, oh, and I wanted to support the patriotism. You drove me to patriotism God bless you. And I love supporting our university presses. So, you know, when they were looking to unload some of their inventory, you know, I'm here to help. I'm here to serve. Just, I'm just going to start calling you St. Joni. St. Joni. St. Saint, Saint, Saint Peggy. All right. So this is the Princeton Uni University Press Sale Hall. You Book Hill. Book Hill? It. Book Hall. Yeah. <laughs> Martine's throwing me off. My no, game here, guys. Not. Come on, Martine. Dude. Let, me do, let me do the work here. All right, so 75%, you guys. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. what led to one shipment led to another, and then I did. Yeah. Oh, wait, so, so it's kind of like crack then. So, like, you're, you're it was crack. like crack. I, I kept going back. For more book crack. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, all right. All right, okay. But anyway, this is so big that I'm going to have to break this up into two videos. Okay, it, Peggy? My people. I'm not going to say how much I spent, but listen, some of these books, okay, normally 40, 50, 60, whatever dollars, 75% off. Just do the math, you know? So, all right, we're going to jump right in after that two and a half minutes uh, opening um, tiff, shall we say? Oh, no, no. She just wants to know, she so wants to know, curious. so curious what my rationale is. I was really able to, again, fill in a couple more gaps in my library. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, and I wasn't the only one. John David, at John David's book channel, I will link his channel below. He also indulged in some very intellectual shopping. I'm trying I'm trying to feed my brain. Right. Okay. All right. We're going to move into the books now, yes? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she says yes. Okay. So um, I made one order, and then I was like, oh, you know what? And the, and the sale is already over. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. It was from January 11th to, to January 22nd. So 11 days of sheer bliss where you just you could, you went crazy, and I did go crazy. But let me know what you think of what I selected. First up, paperback, Princeton university press this is empire and revolution the political life of edmund burke by richard burke okay nice big bodaciously busting biography all right edmund burke lived during one of the most extraordinary periods of world history he grappled with the significance of the british empire in india fought for reconciliation with the American colonies, and was a vocal critic of national policy during three European wars. He also advocated reform in Britain and became a central protagonist in the great debate on the French Revolution. Drawing on the complete range of printed and manuscript sources, Empire and Revolution offers a vivid reconstruction of the major concerns of this outstanding statesman, orator, and philosopher. In restoring Burke to his original political and intellectual context, uh, this book overturns the conventional picture of a partisan of tradition against progress and presents a multifaceted portrait of one of the most captivating figures in 18th century life and thought. 
All right. So, uh, yeah, this thing weighs in at like 900, it's almost a thousand pages. <laughs> Paperback, thousand pages. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember what the list price, I, I mean, I have the, um, I think it was like 50 bucks or something. So 75% off that. What? <laughs> oh, you guys, it was a fantastic sale. And, you know, it's only once a year. So that's that's really how I justify. Mm -hmm. And she's, mm-hmm, you know, mm -hmm. over there. Ah, oh, well, I know that, but, you know. Okay. Well... This is this is this is who you want to be with, hon. <laughs> you know, it's if you you still have a chance to run. You can run if you want. Well, if the Jerry Lewis impression earlier today didn't do it. Inside joke. All right, so I've been wanting this book for a long time, and but I really wanted it in hardcover, so I I, I held off on it, but I had. You know, this was praised to the rafters by many people, and I know Steve Donahue loved this book and raved about it. And it obviously is a book that should belong in my collection since I'm a huge Russia, you know, Russian history aficionado, Russian Revolution. I've got just about every book I can get on that, and this sale really plumped up even more my collection. Um, but I was able to get this in hardcover, brand new. I didn't have to go and buy a crappy used copy somewhere. This is crisp and fresh and no cracking of spines in this video. No, no, no. I was appalled when I opened it. Just for anyone who's just watching this, I opened a book in a, in a previous video and the, and the spine cracked right on camera, right in my face. And I was just like, ah. it was horrible. It was, it was, <sighs> the book screamed. I screamed inside. <laughs> but anyway, this is a massive book, The House of Government, um, by Yuri Sleskin. Sleskin. I apologize for not pronouncing that correctly. A Saga of the Russian Revolution, The House of Government. You know this book. You've seen everyone talking about it. Look how, oh, that's a chunkster right there. Beautiful copy, 75% off. I was so thrilled to get this. I mean, the list price is thirty nine ninety five. Uh, do the math. I can't do it right now. Honey, can you do seventy five percent off forty? You know what? I could, but I don't want to. <laughs> she doesn't want to. No. I don't either. I just really don't. Someone in the comments will be, you know, a, a smart aleck and, and and put it in the amount, and I'll say thank you. I, I appreciate that. So yeah, the House of Government, you guys. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, let's see here. Everyone raved about this book. Everyone blurbed it. The House of Government is unlike any other book about the Russian Revolution and the Soviet experiment. Written in the tradition of Tolstoy's War and Peace, Grossman's Life and Fate, and Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Ar Archipelago, Yuri Sleskin's gripping narrative tells the true story of the residents of an enormous Moscow apartment building where top communist officials and their families lived before they were destroyed in Stalin's purges. A vivid account of the personal and public lives of Bolshevik true believers. The book begins with their conversion to communism and ends with their children's loss of faith and the fall of the Soviet Union. Oh my God, this is going to be a gripping read. Completed in 1931, the House of Government, later known as the House on the Embankment, was located across the Moscow River from the Kremlin. The largest residential building in Europe, it combined 505 furnished apartments with public spaces that included everything from a movie theater and a library to a tennis court and a shooting range. Sleskin tells the chilling story of how the building's residents lived in their apartments and ruled the Soviet state until some 800 of them were evicted from the house and led, one by one, to prison or their deaths. Drawing on letters, diaries, and interviews, and featuring hundreds of rare photographs, the House of Government weaves together biography, literary criticism, architectural history, and fascinating new theories of revolutions, millennial pr prophecies, and reigns of terror. The result is an unforgettable human saga of a building that, like the Soviet Union itself, became a haunted house, forever disturbed by the ghosts of the disappeared. Wow. <laughs> that is great writing. Oh, you 
guys. Oh, and look, and also it just it's gonna fit so well back here, like the color scheme, on the on the Russian, the Russian shelf back here. Oh, the two Russian shelves. Okay, it's gonna look great. And I got it for a steal, baby. Oh, I love it. Okay. <laughs> We're just warming up. Next book that will go into the Russian Soviet Union studies. Um, and I had never heard of this book. So as I was browsing the history category, and I, I, I browsed the other, some other categories as well that might be tangential, and, and I knew that I might pick up something uh, that I never would have found before. Um, I came across this book, and it was, was never in my uh, field of vision before. It is On Stalin's Team, The Years of Living Dangerously in Soviet Politics by Sheila Fitzpatrick. So look at that. Brand new hardcover. $35 list price, 75% off. All right. Um, <laughs> let's see. This one says here, uh, Stalin was the unchallenged dictator of the Soviet Union for so long that most historians have dismissed the officials surrounding him as mere yes-men and political window dressing. Uh, and Stalin's team overturns this view, revealing that behind Stalin was a, was a group of loyal men who formed a remarkably effective team with him from the late 20s until his death in 1953. Interesting. Drawing on extensive original research, Fitzpatrick provides the first in-depth account of this inner circle and their families, vividly describing how these dedicated comrades-in-arms not only worked closely with Stalin, whom they both feared and admired, but also constituted his social circle. Readers meet the wily security chief Beria, whom the rest of the team quickly had executed following Stalin's death, Stalin's number two man, Molotov, who c continued on the team even after his wife was arrested and exiled, the charismatic Orjan... Oh man, this is a toughie. Orjan Nikidzi, who ran the country's industry with entrepreneurial flair, and Reeve, who traveled to provincial purges while listening to Beethoven on a portable gramophone, um, and Khrushchev, who finally disbanded the team four years after Stalin's death. Uh, among the book's surprising findings are that Stalin almost always worked with the team on important issues and that after his death, the team managed a brilliant transition to a reforming collective leadership. Hmm. Okay. Let's see. Uh, and it, interesting. Okay. So, picked up that as well. Yeah. And then I think this might be the final book that I picked up that had to do with Russia. Um, because I'm looking down here, uh, these are some more that I, I'm going to do in part two. I think this is, I think this one is it, but, um, it was a must have as soon as I saw it because I don't have this. This is Vanguard of the Revolution, The Global Idea of the Communist Party by A. James McAdams. Um, when did this one come out? Let me see. This one came out in 2017. Uh, let's see, A Vanguard of the Revolution is a sweeping history of one of the most significant political institutions of the modern world. The Communist Party was a revolutionary idea long before its supporters came to power. In this book, J. A. James McAdams argues that the rise and fall of communism can be understood only by taking into account the origins and evolution of this compelling idea. He shows how the leaders of parties and countries as diverse as the Soviet Union, China, Germany, Yugoslavia, Cuba, and North Korea adapted the original ideas of revolutionaries like Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin to profoundly different social and cultural settings. Hmm. Taking readers from the drafting of the Communist, Manif uh, <laughs> Communist Manifesto in the 1840s to the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s, McAdams describes the decisive role played by individual rulers in the success of their respective parties, men like Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, and Fidel Castro. Uh, he demonstrates how these personalities drew in buying conceptions of the party's functions to mesmerize their followers, mobilize their populations, and transform their societies. He also shows how many of these figures abuse these ideas to justify incompre incomprehensible acts of inhumanity. Abused these ideas. Or did they, mm -hmm. 
or did they just um, <laughs> follow, follow them to their logical conclusion? Uh, McAdams explains why communist parties lasted as long as they did and why they either disappeared or ceased to be meaningful institutions by the close of the, of the 20th century. Um, okay, so nice, another great big read on the Russian Revolution and the ideas of communism right here. Okay, boom. All right, next pile over here. So this one, okay, this one will take us to a little bit of everywhere. Let's go over to Turkey. <laughs> so I have a, I have a, bi a big biography on Ataturk, and uh, Ataturk as a personality uh, and as a, as a leader, statesman, um, and the impact he, he had um, in the 20th century in abolish, abolishing the caliphate and um, secularizing Turkey, I found a fascinating individual. Well, this book is about his father. I'm sure he was a perfectly healthy person. Yes. Psychologically, I'm sure he was very stable. <laughs> Talat Pasha. Uh, Talat Pasha, father of modern Turkey, architect of genocide. You're probably wrong on that, huh? I think he probably uh, just picked that up somewhere. He was misunderstood, oh, apparently. Yeah. Um, this is by Hans Lucas uh, Kieser. Kieser. So, yes, this is uh, about Talat Pasha, who uh, lived from 1874 to 1921. Um, he led the triumvirate that ruled the late Ottoman Empire during World War I and is arguably the father of modern Turkey. He was also the architect of the Armenian Genocide, which would result in the systematic extermination of more than a million people, and which set the stage for a century that would witness atrocities on a scale never imagined. This is the first biography in English of the revolutionary figure who not only prepared the way for Ataturk and the founding of the Republic in 1923, but also shaped the modern world as well. Um, in this explosive book, Hans Lucas Kaiser provides a mesmerizing portrait of a man who maintained power through a potent blend of the new Turkish ethno-nationalism, the political Islam of former Sultan Abdul Hamid II, and a res readiness to employ radical solutions, in quote, solutions, um, and violence. Um, from Talat's role in the Young Turk Revolution of 1908 to his exile and sensational assassination in Weimar, Germany, uh, Kieser restores the Ottoman drama to the heart of world events. He shows how Talat wielded far more power than previously realized, making him the de facto ruler of the empire. He brings wartime Istanbul vividly to life as a, as a thriving diplomatic hub and reveals how Talat's cataclysmic actions would reverberate across the 20th century. Yes. So, um, I, I had to have it. I, had to, I mean, it's going to go right next to my Ataturk biography. Um, so, yeah. Talat Pasha. It's a rogues gallery, folks. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, here's someone who's not a rogues gallery candidate. This, I got this uh, paperback version. Are we going to, you know what you should do, when, when we go to the new house, you need to really make that a feature in the house so that like people, so that we can play Risk or something and, yeah. and just have the, the entirety of nations of the world re and their, their most reprehensible figures uh, represented in your library. Somehow it should Thank be like a, it just should be like a horror. It'll be the, ro it'll be the rogues gallery section of the library. That's all right. We're moving on to something great now, hon. It's all over. We're going to move on to Pericles of Athens by Vincent Azule. Forward by Paul Cartledge. Uh, I love his books. He's a great historian of the ancient Greece. And uh, one of, I think my favorite book by him is on the Spartans. But anyway, so yeah. Oh, this is translated by Janet Lloyd. So... Um, or history on Pericles, originally written, probably, obviously, in Greek, um, and forward by Paul Cartledge. So, 
let's take a look-see, shall we? Pericles has the rare distinction of giving his name to an entire period of history, embodying what has often been taken as the golden age of the ancient Greek world. Periclean Athens witnessed tumultuous political and military events and achievements of the highest order in philosophy, drama, poetry, oratory, and architecture. Pericles of Athens is the first book in decades to reassess the life and legacy of one of the greatest generals, orators, and statesmen of the classical world. In this compelling critical biography, Vincent Azoulay takes a fresh look at both the classical and modern reception of Pericles, recognizing his achievements as well as his failings. From Thucydides and Plutarch to Voltaire and Hegel, ancient and modern authors have questioned Pericles' relationship with democracy and Athenian society. This is the enigma that Azoulay investigates in this groundbreaking book. Um, boom. So, um, yeah, so in the, in the soft covers were we way cheaper, like $7 or something. So, you know, what can I say? This will go nicely with my other uh, books on the matter. And, uh, you know, and since it is uh, written or it's translated history, I'd like to see. I'd actually want to read this sooner rather than later just to get a feel for um, the historiography that's closer to home as far as, you know, Greece is concerned. Very cool. Okay, so I got that. All right, three more books, guys. We're at 21 minutes. I hope to keep these at about 30 minutes. So um, three more books. All right. And then we go to Scandinavia. Ooh. This is... is just inspired by Assassin's Creed with these recent purchases? Just to, just to <laughs> I might have been. You know what? No, this book I might have gotten because uh, as a gamer, and I did, yes, I do game. That is possible that one can be a, a serious reader but also have an appreciation for um well done games gaming anyway uh i'm a geek what can i say this is cross and scepter the uh rise of the scandinavian scandinavian kingdoms from the vikings to the reformation uh, by Sver baggy now Yes, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, I am currently playing, and, and yes, so I'm very steeped in the Viking stuff right now, but um, this looked very interesting, and uh, I've never read it, so uh, it says here, Christianity in European-style monarchy, you guys, let me just take a drink real quick. It's no joke, when you're talking this long, I've been making like three videos in a row. I mean, the sun has gone down. The sun was shining when I started making videos. I'm trying desperately to catch up to just everything coming across the threshold and uh, keep on top of, you know, um, book stuff, book plans, book reading, book accumulation. You know what I'm saying? Um <laughs> That was my elbow. Yeah, uh -huh. That was my elbow sure. on the desk. Yeah. I did not no, do yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> now we're getting punchy. My elbow's resting on this wooden yeah. table, and it went, uh -huh. uh, I really didn't do what you think I did. No. I didn't. No, please continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, seriousness now. Christianity and European-style monarchy, the cross and the scepter, were introduced to Scandinavia in the 10th century, a development that was to have profound implications for all of Europe. Cross and Scepter is a concise history of the Scandinavian kingdoms from the age of the Vikings to the Reformation, written by Scan Scandinavia's leading medieval historian. Sver Baggy, I think that's how I pronounce his name, shows how the rise of the three kingdoms not only changed the face of Scandinavia, but also helped make the territorial state the standard political unit in Western Europe. He describes Scandinavia's momentous conversion to Christianity and the creation of church and monarchy there, and traces how these events transformed Scandinavian law and justice, military and administrative organization, social structure, political culture, and the division of power among the king, aristocracy, and common people. Baggy sheds important new light on the reception of Christianity and European learning in Scandinavia and on Scandinavian history writing, philosophy, political thought, and courtly culture. 
Uh, he looks at the reception of European impulses and their adap adaptation to Scandinavian conditions and examines the relationship of the three kingdoms to each other and the rest of Europe, paying special attention to the inter-Scandinavian unions and their co consequences for the concept of government and the division of power. All right. So, Cross and Scepter provides an, uh, an essential introduction to, the Scan to Scandinavian medieval history, for scholars and general readers alike. All right. Again, the cross and scepter. What? Okay, sorry. I got this thing in my way. All right. Two more books. 25 minutes. We're getting there. Okay, now we jump over to the other side of the uh, the oceans to our side here. We're going to go to Mexico, guys. And this is... Uh, I've been accruing some really cool books lately on, like, Central America, South America, um, really getting more into that history and, uh, and, Mexican, and Mexican history as well, in Mexico. So this is The Mexican Heartland, How Community Shaped Capitalism, a Nation, and World History, uh, from 1500 to 2000 by John Tutino. So... It's, you know, pretty decent size. I really love the artwork on the front. Everyone's sitting down to like a meal. I think that's what I'm seeing here. Or they're working in the fields and stuff, you know. Anyway. Um, the Mexican heartland provides a new history of capitalism from the perspective of the, of the landed communities surrounding Mexico City. Uh, in a sweeping analytical narrative Spanning the 16th century to today, John Tutino challenges our basic assumptions about the forces that shaped global capitalism, setting families and communities at the center of histories that transform the world. Despite invasion, disease, and depopulation, Mexico's heartland communities held strong on the land, adapting to sustain and shape the dynamic silver capitalism so pivotal to Spain's empire and world trade for centuries after 1550. Uh, they joined in, in, in insurgencies that brought the collapse of silver and other key global trades after 1810, as Mexico became a nation, then struggled to keep land and self-rule in the face of liberal national projects. They drove Zapata's 1910 revolution, a rising that rattled Mexico and the world of industrial capitalism. Although the revolt faced defeat, adamant communities forced a land reform that put them at the center of Mexico's experiment in national capitalism after 1920. Then, from the 1950s, population growth and technical innovations drove people from rural communities to a metropolis spreading across the land. The heartland urbanized, leaving people searching for new lives, dependent, often desperate, yet still pressing their needs uh, in a globalizing world. Fascinating. Uh, it's a masterful work of scholarship. The Mexican Heartland is the story of how landed communities and families around Mexico City sustained silver capitalism, challenged industrial capitalism, and now struggle under globalizing urban capitalism. So, well, you know, it's, eh, we got a lot of economic history, um, but it's not, it still looks like it's, uh, you know, it's still made for the general reader, you know. Um, insurgencies and empires, communities challenging capitalism. I don't know. It sounded fascinating to me. And it was dirt cheap. So. Always something I say yes to. Okay, and then this last one is another big chunkster. <laughs> um, I, had, I had not seen this before anywhere. So, And this book came out... It's another a book of history in, um, in translation. It came out in 2018. Big study. This is Unfabling the East. The Enlightenment's Encounter with Asia by Jürgen Osterhammel. Oof. Big guy here. Uh, whoa. It's about 670 pages. Um... It, it, the premise just sounded kind of uh, just really large, and I kind of like that. And, and it, sorry, and it, it kind of takes a, a wider view of you know 
the Enlightenment and, and how it was brought to Asia or and how it what Asia's specific, um, you know, philosophical leanings kind of lent to the Enlightenment. But here, I'll, I'll read this real quick for you. We're at 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, During the long 18th century, Europe's travelers, scholars, and intellectuals looked to Asia in a spirit of puzzlement, irony, and openness. In this pan- panoramic and colorful book, Jürgen Osterhamel tells the story of the European Enlightenment's nuanced encounter with the great civilizations of the East, from the Ottoman Empire and India to China and Japan. Here is the acclaimed book that challenges the notion that Europe's formative engagement with the non-European world was invariably marred by an imperial gaze and presumptions of Western superiority. Osterhamel shows how major figures such as Leibniz, Voltaire, Gibbon, and Hegel took a keen interest in Asian culture and history and introduces lesser-known scientific travelers, colonial administrators, Jesuit missionaries, and adventurers who returned home from Asia bearing manuscripts and many exotic languages, huge collections of ethnographic data, and stories that sometimes defied belief. Osterhamel brings the sights and sounds of this tumultuous age vividly, vividly to life, from the salons of Paris and the lecture halls of Edinburgh. There you go. Thank you. To the deserts of Arabia, the steppes of Siberia, and the sumptuous courts of Asian princes. He demonstrates how Europe discovered its own identity anew by measuring itself against its more senior continent, and how it was only toward the end of this period that cruder forms of Eurocentrism and condescension toward Asia prevailed. So it's a momentous work uh, of scholarship, and I look forward to, um, you know, I don't know, I, I, can, I can just tell I would get really lost in this. It would be awesome. And the bibliography. Ooh, yes. Oh, my. Oh, my God. Rabbit hole. Rabbit hole time. Uh, I should say this was translated by Robert Savage. Okay, so this is um, definitely in, in translation, but um, I'm glad to see it in English, Unfabling the East, you guys. So that is the first set. Well, I've, I've broken down all the different shipments, so I'm just going to do two separate videos. Um, this is part one, and... Uh, <laughs> And then I'll have a part two. And then that was it. That's it for the year, you know, as far as Princeton goes. Right. That's a really important qualifier, everybody. I hope you're paying attention to that one. You know what? People out there understand me because yeah, they you know, are me. And, and you need to stop writing to Peggy to, and supporting her in this. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the one voice going, no. I know she's the one voice of reason saying, "No, Peggy, enough." And you know she's got every right to say that. We have I every, just... right, every right to write back and go, "I think you're doing a great thing." Right. Anyway, guys, let me know what you think about these books. I'm so excited to share them with you. Um, I've got another set right down there, and I've got a few more in a box I haven't opened yet. But I will, the ones I haven't opened yet, I will include with these, and I will show these probably, God, am I going to make another one tonight, or should I stop? I'm so, oh, she says go for it. it. More punchiness may ensue, guys. Okay, that's it for part one. Please come back for part two, because we've got more Princeton University It'll Press goodness. Weirder. It'll only get weirder, and the books will only get better. Huh? All right? Thank you very much. All right. See you, book dude.